Hello and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Strange Playgrounds podcast, episode six. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who uh, commented on the last video. Uh, I and my guest Kit Power were most, most pleased because that conversation we both really rather enjoyed. Expect more of that um, in episodes to come. But for this evening, for evening it is here on my side of the screen, um... I don't know. I think I'm just going to waffle on about some a subject that's sort of near and dear to my heart, as anyone who has read my work will be aware of, uh, both my, my fiction and my, um, my more documentary work. If you head on over to uh, gingernutsofhorror.com, and I will leave links below, you'll find a lot, and I mean a lot, of my essays, reviews, articles, and all sorts of stuff um, relating to horrific material, to literature, to film, to cinema, and indeed to video games. I write a lot about video games because video games are a significant part of my input. As, um, as they are for a lot of my generation, I feel peculiarly privileged in that regard. I'm, I must be part of one of the last generations that remember vaguely a time before there were home video games before there was a computer in every household or a video game console in every household for me it would have been the first five years of my life um so but i'm also part of that generation for whom video games were a significant part of our development we in fact were developing as they were our perspectives our intellects our imaginations our delusions of personality were developing as that medium was we came in as it were we were born really in the earliest days of home computing um and as a result we really we grew up with the evolution of video games it's very peculiar it's very strange. We went through our infancy as they did. We went through our childhood as they did. We went through our adolescence as they did. It's an odd relationship. And as such, video games are as much part of our input and our influence as any other medium. Literature, cinema, home home video. I mean, this is another thing that we are very, very strange. In fact, a totally unique phenomena in humanity at the time, we grew up with those mediums, with the the medium, the visual media, uh, which was far and beyond in terms of its excesses than what our parents experienced, and certainly what our grandparents experienced, for better or worse. Um, it's a thing that I find endlessly fascinating. Influence and input, the, the things that shape the natures of our imaginations and our tastes and our inclinations later on, I find that endlessly fascinating. And what I, I, it's difficult to analyse, it's very difficult to assess because it's like trying to assess your own state of consciousness or your own state of mind. You can't do it. There's that hideous phrase, I know my own mind, I feel fucking hate that turn of phrase i fucking loathe it because if there's one thing in all of reality that you cannot know it's your own mind it's your own mind because you cannot even pretend objectivity on it your the, the mind is both the subject of assessment and also the medium of assessment so therefore it cannot assess itself you cannot for example take any particular thing any any particular object or phenomena place it aside and say there it is that is my mind there is all of the threads of influence that determine why it came out in that shape in that current in in that current state it's impossible you can't do it it's the point at which Attempting to analyse one's own state of mind is the point at which rationality breaks down. It's not possible to do. Um, it actually defies rational assessment. One could go and undertake various neurobiological experiments which would be able to tell you which parts of your brain are firing under particular pressures and in response to particular input, but that wouldn't tell you anything about the experience of your own mind. It wouldn't tell you anything about the abstract of your own mind because such experiments don't pretend to. There's actually very little science can actually tell us about 
the states of our own mind, certainly the experiential elements of them. That is abstraction. That is the it's the remit of poetry and of art and of metaphysics. Um, and it doesn't pretend to. I mean, it doesn't actually pretend to. What science can tell us is the is about the the quantifiable elements of our intellectual processes, which of course refers to our neurobiology primarily. Um, but this is it's this kind of impotent quest. It's one it's one that's doomed to failure, but it's also one that I think is absolutely essential. There will never be any end product from this kind of self autopsy, from this kind of self analysis. There will never be any kind of end product. There won't ever even be any kind of certainty. You will never come to any clear conclusion. For a number of reasons. First of all, the mind is not a solid object. It is not something that you can say, well there it is, that is the absolute product. That is the final shape of it. It doesn't work like that. It's a process and it's endlessly shifting and changing in response to external stimuli to revelations to um what you feed into it and so on and so forth therefore the shape of it is in flux always your state of mind and personality is always in flux whether you like it or not whether you want to admit it or not the notion those little certainty are a delusion they're a delusion um there's no such thing there is absolutely no such thing. It is just a construct that we use for day-to-day uh, -day discourse, for function's sake, for the sake of brevity. But if we ever stopped to analyse the states of our own minds, we would realise that inside we are storms, we are maelstroms, we are, we are fluctuating conditions, always and forever. Whatever notions of anchorage and of certainty we might pretend are exactly that they are skirt clinging pretensions and that's it they are delusions they are in fact delusions and i really like that one can respond to that in a number of different ways um one can respond to it with despair for example with delusion um because it leaves you unanchored it leaves you without any kind of certainty to grapple onto or to define yourself by um, or on the other hand you can regard it with celebration because it means there is nothing constricting you there is nothing imposing upon you you can rewrite your own sense your own state of mind once you realize that it is in fact a a thing that is in perpetual flux it's an end product and there is no such thing as an end product in reference to it um but it endlessly fascinates me it endlessly fascinates me i enjoy looking at the images that my own mind throws up for example the images and the notions and the concepts that it throws up and wondering where they came from what influence and input fostered them um what are they bastardized from uh, and then going back to experiences I remember from my childhood and my adolescence and hypothesizing on whether that is where they came from, whether that is the is the the piece of media that inspired that image or that fascination or that obsession. And it's particularly interesting for me because of the the efflorescence of home media in almost every respect throughout the 1980s our input was huge our visual and narrative and artistic input was fucking huge for the most part we didn't just get as kids a lot of people who were born in the 1980s didn't just get cartoons we didn't just get children's shows we we had unparalleled access to television and to vhs cassettes and to um, cassette tapes and CDs later on and, and video game cartridges and floppy disks and whatnot. So we got a hold of a lot of shit that we were not supposed to. And in, in many respects, we were just allowed to watch it because really it, it's unpoliceable. Even back then it was unpoliceable. It's even more so now with the internet. Bloody hell. I mean, you can get a hold of anything. Children can and will get a hold of any medium. And that's not necessarily a terrible thing. I know, I know that there is a certain sort of hand-wringing, um, would somebody think of the children demographic out there. Children are far more resilient and able to cope with um, any number of images and concepts and notions that adults actually aren't. Their minds are such that they are far more fluid and capable of digesting um and of assessing 
input than adults often are. Um, and as long as they are given the proper contexts, then often they'll be fine. They'll be absolutely fine. Um, my brother and I, and in fact, most of my generation, most of the people I know from my generation, we grew up with horror films. We grew up with horror video games. We grew up with all manner of media that had horrific elements. What that says about ours and what that has resulted in really isn't for us to assess. It really isn't. We can't do it. It's like, it's like when people say something like, "Well, I in the um, the spanking and hitting children debate," which I won't go too deep into here, other than to say that I profoundly disagree with um, hitting or spanking children. It's violence towards children, and that's the end of it. But one of the common responses from the other side of that debate is, "Well, I was I was spanked as a kid." and it didn't do me any harm, you can't say that. You're not in any position to say that. You don't know. You cannot look at... You You have no objectivity over your own state of mind and over your own personality and over your own behaviours. Um, you cannot assess what influences the responses that you experience. None of us can. It's impossible. Um... You don't know whether it did you any harm or not. You're not in a position to say that. Although it would be interesting to analyse, would it not? I mean, if you look at the people who say that and, um, well, look at their relationships, their home life, their mental states and see if it did do them any harm. Because, uh, quite frankly, all of, and I mean all of the actual studies that have been done into it conflict entirely with that anecdote. It does do you a lot of harm. But that's besides the point. The point is that we cannot, with any degree of objectivity or certainty, analyse the states of our own minds and how influence affects them. Um, and for my generation, and certainly for me, video games played a big part in that. Interactive media was a big part of that. My first video game system was a Commodore Amiga, which is a British system. Um, very, at the time, phenomenally advanced. And I mean phenomenally advanced. It was the precursor to home computers. Um, home computers weren't really a thing before then. You had little consoles like the C64, the Sinclair Spectrum and whatnot, but not really multimedia devices as we understand them today. That was the first one that could do things like word processing, that could do spreadsheets and that could do um, paint and uh, visual... Uh, visual media, that kind of thing. It, it What we expect as standard on uh, home computers now, that was the very first computer that could do those things. And it was the first one that was marginally affordable for, for, for households. I mean, it was still very expensive at the time, but it was a powerhouse of a system. Really, really extraordinary. And that was my first computer. It ran on floppy disks, which is a dead medium, um, which meant that every two seconds, if you were playing a video game, you had to stop and put in another disk. It would say something like, loading, please insert disk two, loading, please insert disk one, oh, game over, please insert disk three, so you can see the game over screen, then insert disk one, so that you could see the title screen again. Um, and we put up with it, we because we didn't know any better. We didn't have anything that was faster at the time, so that was just part of the experience to us. The slowness and the, the, the development of patience that it required when you had to sit there in front of a loading screen that sometimes lasted a very long fucking time, I can tell you um you just you just got on with it because that was how computers worked it was your only experience of them you had nothing to compare them to but what um what i experienced through the amiga was was my very first experience of this kind of interactive media there are images from those games and bits of music and sound that are seared I mean, indelibly seared into my memory. And uh, because they're in memory, which is an awful medium anyway, they've probably been embellished and exaggerated to the nth degree. If I went back and watched them on YouTube, for example, I'd prob I will probably find that they're very different from what I remember. But there are images in those video games that are part and parcel of the way my imagination works. I even remember, I remember the very first video game I ever played. It was a, it wasn't even a full video game. It was a demo disc. It was a demo disc.
disc. You used to when what you used to get for the Commodore Amiga back then were um, magazines. Yeah, this was way before, well before the internet. Um, certainly before it was popular in households. Before it was even possible in households. So to to experience new games or up and coming games you used to buy magazines from local news agents and they would often have floppy disks on the front that had demos of up and coming games and my very first the first video game i ever touched was a demo disk on the front of amiga action which was the the video game magazine that i had um not really knowing at the time that it was a completely shitty magazine but it was um it was a demo of a core design video game called Wolf Child, which is long forgotten now. Long, long forgotten. But there are images from Wolf Child that are in my mind. They are part of who I am. Um, Wolf Child was a kind of... It was this odd mixture of science fiction, Cronenbergian horror and action game. So it had like a lycanthropic element to it. You, the character you played was a werewolf, essentially. But he was not a werewolf created by the bite from a werewolf, by, by mysticism or by magic or a curse or anything like that. No, no, no. He was a self-created werewolf. Created, uh, and it was through his father's genetic research that he became this this entity the wolf child um which is not only a werewolf bizarrely it also has incredible psionic powers for some bizarre reason but there you go and the whole story of wolf child i mean this was in the days when stories were very flimsy because you just didn't have room for them there wasn't the the space on floppy disks to to bother with story um the story was that you play Saul Morrow, who is sort of like this beefcake guy who's very athletic, and the son of um, Dr. Cal Morrow, who is the creator. He's kind of a Dr. Moreau type. He's sort of like a postmodern Dr. Moreau. He is the creator of this new genetic research which um, can hybridize human beings and various animals. And, of course, their laboratory is attacked by a terrorist organization called Chimera, fittingly enough. And the research... Uh, the father is kidnapped, the research is bastardized, and the the man who runs Chimera creates this entire army of hybridized creatures. Um, and as the wolf child, you have to go and fight them and kill them and rescue your father. Um, it's not a very good game at all, by any stretch of the imagination. But here's the thing. When you're a kid and when it's your first and only experience of video games, you have nothing to compare them to in the same way that you have nothing to compare films that you see to or books that you read. So you just take them as they are. You take them on their own merits. You have this very unblinkered view of things where you haven't been... I, I hesitate to use the term, but almost polluted by standards of taste, by enshrinements and impositions of taste. So you just get on with it. And yeah, the controls were a nightmare. They were slow and unresponsive. The levels were kind of samey and all over the place. Uh, the rhythm of the game is all, is bad. It's too fucking hard, too fucking quickly. Um, but I loved it. I loved Wolf Child in the same way I loved Harlequin, which was also another evil bastard of a game. Um, in the same way I loved Myth History in the Making. In the same way that I loved Robocod and all of those games for the Commodore Amiga because they were my first. The, uh, but the imagery, the imagery that these games contained, it's it's in me somehow. It's part of my imagination. The the demo disc of Wolf Child featured the second level, which was this. It's this sort of genetically engineered woodland um, that's very deep and dark where all the trees are immense and mutated and where all of the animals and even the plant life is mutated. And it has, I remember the Amiga had this wonderful effect. I mean, it looks terrible now, but back in the day it was really interesting where it could, sh it could layer colour. So you had this deepening dusk fading to night the higher that you climbed in the canopy which was absolutely amazing at the time so the mood of this forest is very particular it evokes mood in a very particular way it's got this very sort of threatening ominous dusky quality and it reminds me 
looking back at it now in my own memory, thinking about it, it reminds me of other woods in other mythologies, like quintessential woods, like the wood at the beginning of Dante's Inferno that uh, Virgil stumbles through on his way into hell. It reminds me of the wood that Little Red Riding Hood skips through. It reminds me of the wild wood of Wind in the Willows. And in my own imagination, it sort of coalesced into this uber wood, this wood that is not actually real or literal, but is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for so much of humanity's psyche and so much of what makes humanity what it is, of my own imagination, but also the collective human imagination. It's that part of us that is afraid of the deep dark woods because we were conditioned to be. In our earliest days, we were conditioned to be, and that memory has been passed down. It's been enshrined in our folk, ta- our folk tales, our mythologies, our cultures, our religions even, but also in our DNA. It's a, it's a memory that is passed down. We're still afraid of the deep, dark woods. We're still afraid of what mysteries might be lurking in it. Um, it's that part of us that when we're wandering dark and deep and abandoned places, projects all sorts of phantasms into them. I just love that. I just love it. That conjures fey things and changelings and and um, old Celtic gods and witches, bacchanals and all of that kind of thing. I love that. I have... That is... It's an element not only of horror, but of fantasy and of of just a fiction in general and of art that will always get me. It will always, always, always snare me. There's something about that. And it's sort of, it was one of my earliest experiences of that concept, the wood, not just a wood, but the wood, the 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 meta wood, if you like, the wood of all woods, the wood of the of which all others are merely derivatives. It's the dream of the ultimate woodland in the human psyche. That's what this image has become. From just being a level in a video game that I experienced as a child, that's what it's become in my own imagination. And it crops up again and again and again and again. If anyone out there has read my short story collection, Strange Playgrounds, you'll find it in a couple of those stories. Um... I have a much bigger mythology in the works at the moment, um, which pervades a lot of my short stories, which involves that wood particularly. The wood that we all wander at some point in our lives, whether we remember it or not, while we're dreaming in moments of idle fantasy, um, which is the place of our dreams and nightmares it's it's sort of the the arena of our imaginations it's it's part it's the wood that surrounds the garden of eden um it's it's not a garden like that particular place it's not corralled by walls it's not tended to or or trimmed back um with reference to some design it's wild It's wild and it's untamed and it's mysterious and it's haunted. That that dichotomy I love. That dichotomy between the garden and the wood I absolutely love. Let me wander in a woodland um, any day of the week over a fucking garden. Um, Very un-English of me, by the way. Very, very un-English and I'm very pleased about that. But there are other influences and inputs too, like The Wind in the Willows. The Wind in the Willows, which I read as a kid, but also I also had the the Rankin Bass cartoon of Wind in the Willows, which is beautiful, by the way, well worth checking out. Stands up really well, even now to a, a postmodern viewing. Um, and the sequence in which Moly goes searching for Ratty in the Wildwood, um, or rather, he doesn't go searching for Ratty. No, 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 no. Moly goes walking, wandering. He's looking for Badger in the Wildwood. Um, it's horrific. It's absolutely horrific. Again, the wild wood in Wind in the Willows is the Ur wood. It's the meta wood. It's not just a woodland. It's the woodland of our genetic nightmares. It's the place where all of the unfathomable and forgotten and unknowable things lurk. It's the it's the wood where you 
likely run into something like the Slender Man, or something to that effect. And in the both in the book, but in the book it's actually an horrific sequence. It's actually framed really quite powerfully. It's frightening as all hell, and it's densely psychological. There's not actually anything there. There's nothing terrifying there, but. Moly imagines things there. The shadows lengthen, the trees start to look as if they're grasping at him, as though their roots are coming alive, as though they have faces in their bark. And it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Um, and in the Rankin Bass cartoon, the sequence is absolutely horrific and it's it's so different from the rest of the cartoon and i didn't appreciate it as a kid i didn't notice so much not consciously because you don't it's just part of the cartoon you just get on with it as a kid but re-watching it as an adult i was struck i was absolutely struck by how powerfully weird and surreal and strange and dark this sequence is i will link to it below because it is available on youtube and it's really cool i would definitely advise you going to check it out um but the point is it's that same effect it's that er uh, wood it's that thing it's that state that plants imagery in your mind whether you know it or not and as often as a kid this imagery is unconscious it's not something you consciously notice but something that will crop up again later especially if you are a creative soul of any kind if you if you paint or if you create art if you write this stuff will come out it will it will bleed out of you in some way in very powerful and um often quite profane ways and it's why I I don't know. I honestly, I mean, it sounds kind of pretentious and fucking artsy, I know. But I don't know how anyone lives without some kind of creative output. I honestly don't. I don't know how people live without it. I don't know how people live without exorcising and exploring that shit in their subconscious. That, that, that boiling, florid ocean. That, that place where... All of the weirdness of your nightmares and your dreams lives where it's born, where this imagery plants itself and erupts into new and it, it in new forms and new states and new conditions and it intermingles with other inputs and influences. It becomes its own thing. I find that fascinating and that is that is kind of what i want to do that's what i want to do with my fiction it's it's i i don't want i mean this is this is ostensibly a horror podcast but horror is such i find that horror the the definitions that people apply to that and the assumptions and expectations can often be so limiting they can often be so limiting and that's a real shame because at its best horror isn't that at its best horror is florid and experimental and it distresses us it does want to get in there it does want to reach inside of your most forbidden places those places where you know where when you an image crops up in your mind and it makes you go it makes you lurch back it makes your your gut your your lips pull back over your teeth and it makes you deny it it makes you sublimate it it almost becomes a neurosis because it's so it's so distressing to you that your imagination is capable of that. Maybe it's something highly sexual and deviant that you would never, ever believe that your imagination was capable of. Maybe it's something that you find morally repugnant, um, but you deny it. And when you deny it, you sublimate it. It goes down, down, down into these not entirely sealed depths, and it becomes a little monster, a little demon inside your own mind, and it will express itself if unacknowledged it's like a it's like a denied child it will express itself whether you like it or not and i would argue i'm no psychologist but i would argue that denying it is the worst thing you can do denying these things the darkness inside of you the things that make you distressed at yourself at the operation of your own mind is it's a shortcut to lunacy it will express itself in quite unhealthy ways, quite unhealthy ways, um, I would argue that this is where you get, why you get a lot, a, a significant amount of forms of abuse in certain institutions. 
certain institutions which by their very nature repress and deny certain impulses and certain experiences there there is no denying them there is no denying this dimension of human operation they will express themselves whether we want them to or not and through denial and through sublimation they become sickness they become a kind of psychological cancer and they will express themselves in very dark and unhealthy ways and at its best this is what horrific material allows us to experience and explore it's a way of it's a way of exploring those elements of ourselves that we might otherwise not want to that we might otherwise not like of it's a way of the very best horror is horror of confrontation not of escapism in the same way or, or denialism for that matter in the same way that the very best fantasy is exactly the same it's exactly the same it is not escapism it's confrontation it provides an arena via which you can explore these notions metaphorically in an abstract way where there is no immediate consequence Um, and that's why i love things like fairy tales it's why i love things like wind in the willows it's why i love even things like the chronicles of narnia which we discussed in a previous episode and which has its contentions but even that even that has these elements you have that urwood again the in the lion the wish in the wardrobe um the pevensies lucy edmund peter susan and lucy they emerge into narnia through a wood in the same way that dante emerges through a wood into hell in the same way that little red riding hood has to walk the path through the wood to get to granny's house in the same way that the fey things and the changelings and the earl king's hunt they all operate within the woodlands in the same way that keanunos and um his followers they conduct their bacchanals within woodland it's a very interesting thing there is something about there is something probably ineffable and uncanny about the woodland that has a very particular effect upon the human imagination there are not many fantasy stories for example that do not have a woodland in them somewhere and often the woodlands are very evocative if you look at say the hobbit you have mirkwood um if you look at the lord of the rings you have lothlorien and a number of others you have uh, not only lothlorien but you also have fangorn um it just seems to be something that exercises a very particular hold over human imagination and is almost universal it's almost universal you have uh, le gevordan in the middle of france which is a wood that is an actual wood it still exists but le gevordan is infamous infamous because it's not it's not necessarily the where werewolf myths were born but it is where werewolf myths coalesced there was a particular event or series of events within le gevordan um, i believe in the middle of the 17th century i may be wrong on that but i believe it was in the middle of the 17th century in which people who were passing through le gevordan um were being murdered they were being ripped to shreds they were being not just murdered they were not just being murdered if if the accounts are true which they may or may not be it's very difficult to determine anything from that time they were butchered they were ripped apart and bits of them scattered everywhere and this was a very very common occurrence it happened a lot and leg of ordon was one of the wilds of france it was largely uncharted if you strayed from the path you were going to get lost and you were going to die it's still very much like that by all accounts it is a wild wild place and if you ever look it up if you ever look at pictures of it it is this urwood it's like a fantastical deep dark woods it's like the wild woods um but what happened was people you know townspeople the of the the people of the local villages being incredibly superstitious and largely being governed by their ministers by their priests by their churches um started to attribute these murders to wolves which was probably not true given the nature of the accounts probably not true um and then started to attribute them to something supernatural i.e a werewolf or a pack of werewolves which they called le gavordon after the forest um which i have no doubt the tales of which i have no doubt were stoked by their ministers and their priests and their pastors because of course there's nothing like inspiring a bit of faith than a bit of fear 
is there than having a a bogeyman you know a very handy demon or bogeyman with which to frighten the uneducated and the um, the pastoral uh into submission there's nothing like it um but it's a very good example of how myth coalesces around particular areas because of particular events there are actually postmodern analyses of the accounts of what happened in Lego Vordon and most of them come to the conclusion that given given what was done it was almost certainly a man that was doing the killings it's almost certainly a serial killer or maybe even more than one serial killers because the the killings were there was a ritualistic element to them it seems although that's very difficult to determine it does seem as though there was a certain ritualistic element to them and also the victims were not eaten they were, there was no account of them being eaten. There was only accounts of them being butchered. So it was almost certainly maybe a serial killer um, of that era. Who knows? It's impossible to determine at this point. But what is more important than the facts of the situation is the myth. Because the myth has gone on. The myth has resonated down. Down the centuries. Down the eons. And if you... If you go to Legevordon or any of the surrounding villages, there's an abbey nearby, I believe, then you'll be able to pick up werewolf paraphernalia. You'll be able to pick up accounts of what happened in Legevordon. You'll see werewolf imagery everywhere. Um, and not only that, but the myth itself of Legevordon has transcended both the area and the... Um, not only the area, but its original parameters. So Legavordon can be found in other places now. You'll find Legavordon in video games. You'll find Legavordon in board games even. There's a there's anyone who ever played the video board game Atmosphere, which was called Nightmare in the US. Uh, one of the characters you could play was the werewolf Legavordon back in the day. Yes, indeed. The werewolf Legavordon. But it's a very good example of how these areas... These places of uncharted wilderness and wildness still exercise very particular holds over our imaginations. Um, and how that the the evocation of them through particular media seems to resonate with something that we can't define, something that's it bred into our cells, and it therefore latches, it lodges inside of us, and it coalesces into something new. There are there is not just one meta wood. For example, there's not just one Urwood. There is not one Legevordon or Wildwood. There are as many as there are minds and imaginations to experience them or to conjure them. Um, that's also the fun of it. It's the fact that there is no real universe. Although the imagery might be universal, the manifestation of that imagery never will be. It will change and shift and develop depending upon the unique natures of the imaginations that harbour them. Therefore, your Wildwood will be different from mine. And that fascinates me. That absolutely fascinates me. You could, in the same way that in cooking, if you take two people, give them the same ingredients and say, cook a curry or cook in the UK, cook a Sunday dinner or something like that, you will get two very different plates of food, um, even if the ingredients are the same, even if they make a very similar thing. For example, but if, they both, if they're doing the curry, if they both make korma, you will get two different kormas because how each of them has learned to cook those things will be very different. Their definitions of those things will be, and their experiences of those things will be very different within the parameters set by the ingredients of the dish and the processes of the dish. The same is absolutely true for imagining things, for writing and art and whatnot. Um, two people will not conjure the same wild wood um they will not have the same they will not have the same significance for two people for example for a lot of people it is still a thing of fear it is still something that occurs in horror films and in fantasy as something to be afraid of the slender man is a really good example of this the rake and the slender man two creatures that were born on the internet um but which have transcended that medium they are basically internet urban myths um that have transcended the medium and have now spilled out into wider culture which is absolutely wonderful by the way and i will be doing an episode on those oh yes my god will i um 
But they occur in woods, not primarily, but largely they occur in woods. They are still these fey things, they are still changelings, despite the fact that they are children and myths of a new that operate on a new medium, i.e. the internet, the most postmodern medium you can get. They are still expressing these old, very human, these ancient concerns. They're still operating within these ancient and innately human environments i love it i absolutely love that because it tells us something about ourselves it tells us something about our species and about our evolutionary history it tells us something about the ways our minds and our psyches operate and um i love it I absolutely love it. I'm fascinated by it, as I've said. Um, and the woodlands is something that crops up again and again and again and again because of the, uh, not not exclusively, but because of the input I had as a child because a lot of it did feature these wild woodlands where wild and fey and strange and fantastical things lived. Um, but what I like, what I enjoy is the fact that I can now take that input and that influence and the new things that it is it has become in my own imagination and give them to you i can actually give them to someone else and i can communicate it to someone else who will then take my wildwood and they will make it their wildwood it becomes theirs it becomes their property their territory in their own minds and it will become this new playground. It will become this new place for them to walk and to wander and to experience miracles and darkness and fear and just any hideousness that they can conjure. I love that. I love that. I love the fact that once a story or a piece of art is out of the creator's hands and is out in the public arena, it doesn't belong to them anymore. It belongs to the people who experience it in a very very real way um they take it and via their consumption and interpretations of it the lenses and experiences and influences through which they filter it they create their own thing they create their own um preconceptions of how these character how the characters look and feel and operate how the the worlds and places and settings occur and i love that i love that it's why it's why creating cinematic adaptations of literature is so bloody hard it's so hard to get it right especially when those those works of literature are highly visual one of the most successful I can think of one or there there are a couple actually but one of two of the most successful I can think of one is Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy now the Lord of the Rings trilogy Peter Jackson I prefer the films to the books myself uh, despite being a hardcore Tolkienite when I was a young man um, I prefer the films to the books I think they do things with the story and with the settings and with the characters that the books probably should have done but didn't um, but that's kind of besides the point what i always what i find perpetually fascinating about those films is that they have latched onto something universal almost everyone i've ever spoken to they they say the same things as i do which is when i saw bag end when i saw the shire when i saw hobbiton when i saw gandalf and his cart going up the hill that was my bag end that was my hobbiton that was my shire that was my gandalf and his cart they captured something quintessential it's as though they opened up our skulls and dropped cameras into our minds and filmed what we were imagining as we read the book and that's amazing that's amazing that is an accomplishment that requires far more than any conscious effort on behalf of the filmmakers it actually requires a very particular magic a confluence of things that is almost impossible to the point of miraculous it's the kind of thing that that makes me i am believe me i am an entirely skeptical rational person but it's the kind of thing that makes me doubt that it's the kind of thing that makes me think god that that is there is such powerful poetry there it's almost as though there is something external influencing it to make it perfect to make it right and i love that i love that i think that's amazing the other adaptation that i think is nigh perfect is quite obscure it's the uh adaptation of patrick suskind's perfume the story of a murderer that 
it's perfect in an entirely other way. It does capture the world and the characters that Suskind evokes very well, very beautifully, but that's not the point. The point of Suskind is that it, the, the original book, Perfume, the whole endeavour behind it is that it was trying to evoke scent through prose. A very difficult thing to do and to tell a story primarily through evocations of scent. And that is a very difficult thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to do. The book does it beautifully, by the way. Absolutely beautifully. It's so vivid that it actually makes you smell things because it conjures them via association and through imagery. The film attempts to do exactly the same thing through visual media. It tries to evoke smell and to tell its story in that manner. And that is where the adaptation is nigh perfect. It try it makes the same attempt as the book, but attempts to do it for cinema. So the film operates on its own basis, but also as an adaptation that respects the themes and intents of the original book. And that is amazing. That's absolutely incredible. And by the way, if you've never read Perfume, go do it. If you've never seen the film, go do that too. Because they are both wonderful. They're both so beautiful. Um, very, They do what I love in literature, which is they evoke sensation. Um, very vividly and very intensely. Very unpleasantly at times as well. I mean, the, the first scene in Perfume is the birth of the protagonist, Granui, Jean-Baptiste Granui. Um, and he's born in the fish market of, um, I believe it's late 18th century France. Um, and as you can imagine, it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. The, there are people like stumbling and vomiting. There's fish rotting everywhere. There's the poor. The stench must be... I think, I think the book actually describes that in that era of Paris, France, there was a stench just pervasively and ambiently that would drive any any present day living human being to the point of nausea and beyond probably everybody stank everybody stank and everything stank um <clears throat> notions of hygiene hadn't really come about at that point and the aristocracy used to drench themselves in various perfumes and whatnot um and the poor just stank in general um and also people would do things like vomit in the street they would shat in the street they would throw their slop buckets out into the gutters um yeah you can imagine the fish market was probably one of the most foul smelling places in existence at that point and that's where jean baptiste grenouille is born um and it's it is incredible it is incredible that it makes you almost bilious reading it and that's very powerful that's very powerful and the way it does it is by evoking exactly what i've been talking about it it latches on to association it evokes association, which is born as a result of the influence and input that we that we experience. Um, and if, as a writer or as an artist, you can evoke association, you've done it. You've won. You've got them. You've got the audience by the balls. You've got them by the short and curlies. More intimately than that, in fact, far more intimately, you've got them, you've snared them by something that's way more intimate, that even that even lovers can't touch you've got them by their psychological associations by the influence and input that shaped their imaginations and if you can do that then you can you can carry them along you can do it man you can actually you can manipulate them in the most beautiful ways you can manipulate them in ways that they would not expect and which they find distressing and delightful and that i seek that out i personally i seek that out i want that from my fiction i want that from my input i want that from my literature and my video games and my cinema and it bothers me when people don't want it it bothers me when people don't want that because if you don't want to be moved if you don't want to be disturbed if you don't want to be distressed or unsettled why are you bothering why would you why would you try to experience something only to be reinforced um that means nothing to me i don't understand it um it makes the exercise of consuming media pointless 
absolutely pointless. It's why I don't like soap operas and stuff like that, because that's what they're made to do. They're made to coddle you and they're made to reinforce you. They're made to evoke input and influence that I would argue is entirely negative because it's banal. It's banal and it's comforting and it is designed to reinforce what you already assume. Um, whether that's good or positive or um, or inspiring to you or not. And that's hateful. That's a hateful thing for any media, any story to do. But yes, hurtling well back to the beginning, because we went off on a big tangent there, almost a 50-minute tangent, um, video games. Video games were part of my input, and I can still, I can still conjure phantasms of the images that they provided and of the sounds and experience that the experiences that they provided and the phantasms are more they're more important than the truth of them whether they're accurate to the original images is incidental they're almost certainly not but that doesn't matter it's totally incidental because it's the phantasms that have or the, or the the bastardized images that have meaning in my own personal mythology that are part of that um the accuracy does not matter but it's something i seek out in all the media i consume i want i want to have that resonance i want to have that evocation within me um I want that violation, I want that sense of someone else's imagination somehow crossing over and chiming with my own. Um, it's a kind of weird telepathy in an odd kind of way. It is a form of strange telepathy where bits and pieces of other people's minds and the states of their psyches get inside of ours and then germinate. They become kind of parasitic in a very welcome and pleasant way and they intermingle with all the stuff in our own subconsciouses and they create create new stuff they create new things new images new new concepts and i want that i want that i desperately desperately ache for that and massively appreciate media that can do it massively appreciate it there's not much that can there's not much that does do it these days i have to say but when it does when it hits hard it shudders me i can have very powerful reactions to fiction and to literature and to art i can have very visceral reactions to them um which i love i absolutely love and i don't mind i don't as i've said before in previous uh podcasts i don't mind if what they evoke is negative at all i really really don't i don't there, there is a place there is a very definite and legitimate function for literature to conjure negative associations um, that make us feel despair, that make us feel depression, that make us feel anger and fury and disgust. It's all worthwhile. It's all worthwhile exploring because you learn about yourself. You learn about yourself when you have those reactions, um, what you're prepared to allow for, um, what you can endure you learn about yourself and that is essential that's very 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 necessary uh, i don't agree with comforting fiction or art because comforting fiction or art is banal it's always banal um there's no point to it there's no point in consuming it there really isn't um but i find that particular dynamic very interesting the fact that we went from a point where there were no computers, where there were no video games, where video games weren't really a concept, to a point where they were everywhere. And they were ever-evolving, ever-evolving, and throwing new stuff at us all the time. And because they were new, they were often very inventive. They didn't always work, they didn't always have the... They didn't always have the hardware or the capacity to realise the images they wanted to. But... They were often very inventive and very artistic at that point because, of course, there were no parameters. Genres had, had yet to crystallise. Parameters had yet to crystallise. Categories had yet to crystallise. Um, and just conventions. Conventions weren't really there. This was the point at which they were born. So, although horror video games were very rare, they did exist. 
they did exist. And this is something that sort of crosses over with an article I'm going to be writing for the Ginger Nuts of Horror very soon. As part of a series I'm writing about the history of survival horror, I'll put links to that in the syphilis bar below. Um, or the blowjob bar, if you prefer. That's what I like to call it anyway. Um, they did exist, and it was really interesting to me. I remember... I have these very vivid images. My Commodore Amiga is in this very cold little room in my house. Very cold little upstairs bedroom that was always perpetually fucking freezing. Um, and smelled of dust and ozone. And, and of the computer itself, the computer was so basic that it used to basically cook its own insides. So it used to smell of cooking electronics. Um, and that's what the room smelled of eventually. But I remember sitting there and playing games like Dark Seed, for example, which was one of the my first horror video games ever, which was an old point-and-click adventure based around the artwork of H.R. Giga. Um, and being... Absol not only frightened, but disturbed. I remember being disturbed by it, as you would. I mean, you can imagine, as a kid, and I was playing this game that was designed by H.R. Giga, that was based, it had, like, it. the settings actually featured, like, they were, largely, they were derived from animated versions of H.R. Giga's artwork. So you can imagine how distressing that was. And I remember sitting there, it's that point in your life when... The space between the landing and the bathroom is infinite and is a place of infinite potential horrors, especially if there are other doors leading off from it. Anything could be in there. And you're, you haven't yet learned. Your animal brain hasn't yet learned that there's nothing in there. It doesn't matter. They don't exist. Fiction and art and media bleeds out when you're that age. It, it actually bleeds out from your own skull into the world. And anything is possible. You know, your parents can tell you all you like. That there are no monsters under the bed. That there are no such things as ghosts and whatnot. But you, part of your child brain knows that they do exist. And what it doesn't know is that they exist inside your head. It doesn't know that they're abstract. They're not actual. They're metaphors. But... Uh, the child is unable to distinguish between those concepts largely. So I remember sitting playing Dark Seed and being having to psych myself up to turn the computer off, turn off the lights and go out onto the landing and thunder down the stairs because you would be terrified and you would feel, you would be so convinced of it, you would feel things at your back, you would hear things in the bedrooms you, besides you, you would hear you would hear teeth clicking at your neck, you would hear the breath of something, it's nothing there it's absolutely fuck all there but it was, you knew it was and I love that I love that. I, I had the same experience with Alien Breed. Anyone remember Alien Breed? One of the first horror games on the Amiga? Um, yeah, that had a very similar effect upon me. Um, I love that. And the sad thing is, it would be wonderful if you could create some sort of formula for fiction and for media in general that would allow you to evoke that. That sensation of being a child again when your influences and input are very real. And when the products of your own imagination are very real and you lack the ability to rationally differentiate between the actual and the metaphorical, that would be amazing because there is nothing after that period when you've when you've grown out of it, there is nothing that can evoke it again. You might remember it sometimes you might remember vaguely the feeling the sensation of being part of it but it is only very vague and very abstract and not nothing captures the intensity of it again um and that's a real shame that's a real shame i would love to know it again um i would love to know that thrill that sort of trembling terror that almost that almost it is almost real to you. You you actually do believe that there is some Geigerian monstrosity stalking down the stairs behind you and that it will get you if you don't get to the light in the living room where your parents are. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. That state and experience. I try to reconjure it in my writing and in my in my day-to-day -day life because I love it. I love what that feels like. But... 
it's very difficult to do so with any degree of accuracy or legitimacy, I would argue. Right, I think I've rambled on long enough about all this stuff. I think I think next time, because I, I did get sidetracked a little bit, I think next time I will talk a little bit more about virtual horror, about video game horror, but also about the very particular species of horror that's grown up on the internet, because I am going to be writing another series of articles about that for Dark Moon Digest, the periodical that I write for. So, um, yeah. Until then, ladies and gents. By the way, if there's anything you'd like me to discuss, if there's anything you'd like me to talk about, please let me know. If there are any subjects you'd like me to analyse or assess, let me know in the uh, gonorrhea bar down there, in the comments section. Um... Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for uh, listening, for anyone who comments and any suggestions that you might provide. Um, yes, until then, ta-ta!